Okay, um, thank you very much uh, for having me here. It's a pleasure. Um, I'm gonna minim I, I try I'm gonna try to minimize um, my uh, slides and give you as much of a storytelling as I can. So I prepare a very uh, special set of slides today that's quite different from our normal uh, communication when I provide to our uh, this kind of setting or our customers. Um, first of all, we are a uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of us. Uh, we are a um, biosensor solution provider. What does that mean? Uh, it means that our sensors are being integrated into quite a few things um, in, in your daily life. You probably don't know uh, sometimes you're using our, our products. Um, we measure brain waves, we measure cardio signals, we measure muscle signals. And we provide a solution for our customers to uh, re and harvest these signal and and interpret for them so they can apply it to um, different devices, mobile devices. Such you probably all have uh, heard of wristbands and um, some many of you, all of you probably have uh, smartphones here. Um, some smartphone models, not in this country, but in different country, because of FD FDA issues, actually integrate our sensors. So they're everywhere, and I'm gonna give you a small sample of examples of the more exotic ones I thought um, existing today. But it's not about that, it's not about what we have done, but it's about the journey. How we first became a company. When we first started, uh, we had this, um, actually I didn't, uh, I didn't start the company. Um, I sold uh, my previous company uh, to a public company back in 2004. And then, uh, I, for some reason, if you sold a company, you're gonna get a lot of calls, people wanting you to go to their company and run their company for them so that you can sell their company too or something. That doesn't work that way, but that's what people think. So I got a lot of calls. And um, actually, uh, after two companies uh, back then, uh, I was thinking about retirement. So I retired for two weeks. It was the most boring two weeks of my life. And I was sitting at home. For the first time, I had to watch Oprah. You know, didn't, didn't really get into that. Tried to golf, but all my friends were working. You know, I had to golf with strangers, so it didn't work out either. So what did I do? I started thinking, well, maybe I should look around and um, maybe start a third company. Um, but I was just out of ideas. I, you know, I, I was a uh, double E. I thought a, a lot about different tech and all that. Um, finally, uh, and, and several companies, uh, even foreign companies, kind of called me up and I checked them all out. I didn't like them. Finally, uh, the co founders of Neurosky, three professors basically, uh, called me up. And they said, well, we're gonna show you something really cool and ho hopefully you can join us. Uh, we already started the company, but it's just a research, there's three professors. And I don't know how they got together to, up, to, up till today. Their stories are all different. There's three versions, how they got together. But for sure, they got together in one of the conferences like this. Um, one of them is from US, one of them's from uh, Korea, and the other one's from Russia. How they got together is beyond me. But anyway, they got together and formed a company called Neurosky. And I showed up that day. They showed me a very uh, heavy helmet, complicated helmet. I thought it was a diver's goggle with things on top that blinks. And, uh, um, I saw them using it to control a remote control car, a toy car, and they were driving it around the floor, making the turn, and they said, this is what we're gonna show you. You can actually control things with your, with your head. And I said, well, why would I wanna do that? <laughs> what gives me the incentive to want to do that? I mean, I have no reason to want to do that. I mean, it's cool though, it's really cool, but, why? Then they said, well, it's new, it's, it's great, it's, nobody ever heard of this. I say, yeah, um, so it's flying car, but you know, great ideas and making something work doesn't mean it's affordable. 
I calculated it. I so I showed them that if you built this, if we were to build this and we have to sell it, the cost to the consumer is going to be around three hundred dollars. Well, for two at, at that time for two forty nine, you could buy buy a PS three, I believe. Um, why would it, why would anybody uh, buy buy a a car? that can be driven, or anything that can be tr driven by a headset, one trick pony, given it's a very um, you know, new trick, one trick pony, for more money than uh, a PS3 that you could probably play many games on. Like, why would anybody do that? It just didn't make any sense. So I told them no, and I, and I went home and continued to look. Then they called me back through a friend, and said, please give them a, some consideration. And I told that friend, um, no, I, I, I think it's kind of weird. You know, I, I'm not sure what I can do with that. Then they call another, uh, a, uh, a former investor of mine. Now I owe this guy something. So he said, well, would you consider you know, looking at this company again? Now, as a, they are three professors, right? As professors, they just have connections. <laughs> they probably have students and all that in the industry. So I figure they won't stop bothering me until they, I, I say yes. So I said, okay, I'm not saying yes. I'm just going to think about how to do this. How do I take a technology that's so advanced, nobody e ever heard of, and market it and make people want to buy it? How do I do that? A technology ahead of its time, obviously. Uh, and we're talking 2004, five, 2005, I'm sorry. So I told them, no one is going to want to buy If at that time. In fact, even today, if I said, I'm going to give you something, you wear, put it on your head, and you're going to drive something else up and down, left and right. Well, oh, great, I'll try it out. What, you're going to charge me $99? No way. Right? That's how you're going to react. Because there's no need for you to do that. There are three key elements of, of um, you, you must have before you can introduce a new product, brand new technology, not an old one, not an ice cream with different flavor, but brand new idea, brand new technology into the market. There's three key elements. I promise this is the only text you're going to read from my... Uh, from my uh, presentation here. Three key elements, new and easy. What I mean by, you understand new. You haven't seen it before. You, you, um, and, and this new word <coughs> has a very key meaning in my last slide, so I want you to remember that. Um, when you start a startup company or a, a new company or something, by definition, you want to do something new. You don't want to be a me too company, right? But in the technology world, when you have something new, by definition, people never seen it. But if your target customers never seen this, how do you convince them to use it? If you show me something I never in before, although it's made of chicken, I would question a little bit before I put it in my mouth, right? Even though it's chicken, but it's a new way to cook it. You're showing a brand new technology. Why would any of uh, your target customers will be willing to buy this technology? Unless, number two, it addresses a need. There's got to be a need for, for this technology that you're, you're showing. People identify with that problem, and they say, well, OK, this, this method, this technology will address that need. But it has to be easy. Now, I put easy on top. If it takes 10 steps to solve one problem, that's not a goal either. So now that's a big dilemma. That's why I put them together. How can you have something new? And by the way, consumers, all of us, I'll, I'll be the first one to admit, are lazy. When I buy a new car, I never read the user manual. When I buy anything, I never read the user manual. So how do you get somebody to use something brand new without any training, any 
any, uh, they're just lazy, right? You don't, you, you whip out your new phone, you, you expect it to work. And if they don't work, you said it's a dumb product. You don't blame yourself for not studying. That's what we do, right? It's a dumb product. When a product's difficult to use, it's not our fault. It's, it's um, the product's fault. I wear glasses. I oftentimes do this and that. And one side of it would be Ben, I have to take it back to the doctor, the optometrist. He always tells me, you use both hands. Well, it should be designed so I can use one hand, that's what I say. For years, that's what I do. So we blame the product, we blame the design. So when you start a new company, what do you have to do? By definition, you have to give something new, but by definition, it has to be easy. Or nobody's gonna adapt to this technology or this product. And it has to address a sizable mar market. A lot of people has to do it, has to have it. And lastly, it has to be priced correctly. Is your cost, does it justify to go into that market? Without those three things, and, and, and you have to be very confident you meet these three things, you shouldn't do anything because it'll be a waste of your time and money and effort. I have seen so many companies. I sit on boards of many. I, I'm on advisory board of many companies. I always look, look for these three things. Doesn't matter if it's big company, small company, individual. If you try to create something new, think about these. Okay, so that's enough preaching on that. So that was my task when I got called back to uh, these guys. I had to do something to make sure at that time, a brainwave technology that addresses this, right? I have to think hard. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, what we have today in the market is everywhere. You probably understand the uh, wristbands, the cell phones, you know, they have our cardio signal. This is our cardio side, by the way, not the brain side, because I'm going to talk all about the brain side. So I'm going to show you the cardio side. Okay, you, you understand the wearables and maybe the cell phones and the smartwatch, but the toilet and the copier, and the middle is a coffee machine, by the way, in the center. What are sensors doing in there? Okay, I'm not going to go in, that, that's not how we uh, bridge the gap, so I'm just going to give you one example. And in fact, this is a bridging the gap, too. So we were presented with a challenge. How many of you have heard of health care for elderlies. We have to take care of elderlies at home. And now how many elderlies would wear a wristband or carry a smartphone and they know how to use a USB to charge? They don't know. And, and when I show them a wireless charging station, you split their charge, you say, where's the plug? Well, it's hard to teach somebody who was so used to their lifestyle a new trick. It's very difficult. Once we have a behavior, a habit, it's hard for us to change. So when a, a, there are two governments actually out there, they said, well, nearest guy, can you guys give us a solution? Now remember, they don't come to us and ask for we want sensor. We want you to give us a solution. Right? That's, customers are so lazy, they don't even want to do any work anymore. They, just give me the whole solution. I'll, I'll just pluck it down. Two governments said, I want solutions to track our elderly people on a daily basis if they live alone in their apartment. So what do we do? They don't, know, they don't want to hold anything, they don't want to wear anything, they don't want to touch anything. How do we get their cardio signals? ECG, medical quality, and send it up to the internet. Well, we figure they all have to sit on the toilet, right? <laughs> now, it's easy to say, but that took months to think about. <laughs> what, what do old people do that they can't avoid? <laughs> and they have to come in contact with some, well, the toilet seats, duh, they do that, probably more, more times than we do. Okay? So there are smart things we can do with that. Not only we take their data, we analyze their data, and we, we even know, pr we predict when they're gonna go to the bathroom if they're at home. And if they miss one, well, you call the cleaning lady or you, you know, they're in danger, you call the 
medics, right? Make sure they're so that's another example of how do you take how do you um, address a need but without disturbing the easy to use, remember? Without dis disturbing the behavior. You don't have to learn. You know, they, they didn't want to learn how to use U a USB charge and all that, but they didn't need to learn how to use a toilet. So I was presented with a challenge at the very beginning. You have a brainwave technology, how do you address a need? A large need. People who really crave for brainwave technology. Well, I decided one, and that, that took probably, um, actually it took almost a year. And I searched far and wide and went back to my route. I decided this. It was called the Star Wars Force Trainer. One day, I was sitting on the toilet. <laughs> I said, well, what can I do with this brainwave technology? I promised those three professors I was going to think about it. And when I promised somebody something, I would do it. Well, so, OK, I got it. There are uh, millions and millions of Star Wars fans out there, myself included. When I uh, came to this country back in 1978 as a kid, I went to the movie th theater and I watched Star Wars and I was telling myself, wow, what a country, they have technology like this, no wonder they're number one in, in, in the world. <laughs> <laughs> then I found out they're all fake. <laughs> what a disappointment. <laughs> well, then I decided, well, I'm going to become an engineer. I want to study engineering. I'm going to try to create some of these, okay? So finally, I go, wait. My childhood dreams. Um, I never created the force. <laughs> and that was never duplicated. Talked about a lot. I tried to drive the cereal box in my, bre on my breakfast table and failed every single time. But I never, well, I think I tried until I was at least 15. <laughs> and uh, just never succeeded. But I would yank a string and pretend it worked and show my mom. But um, but I was thinking, I can simulate that. And there's got to be a huge need out there. All the Star Wars fans and geeks who dreamt about having the Force. Now I can simulate that with the brainwave technology. Uh, why do I say that, say the Force? Because if I told you, and back then especially, hey, Mr. Customer, if, let's say if I showed up at Target or Walmart, would you buy this? Would you have something to control your brainwave, uh, your, 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 um, your, your, use your brainwave to control something? I say, why? Exactly like my first reaction. But if I told them, hey, do you want Star Wars Force? <laughs> do you want to sell that? Oh, yeah. Heck, yeah. OK. So that, but I didn't have the brand, so what did I do? That was the first part of the equation. So I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Luckily, um, the Skywalker Ranch is in San Francisco. So a few of my um, childhood friends, uh, junior high, high school friends, a few of them were lucky enough to work there. So I called them up. Hey, I found out how to use the force. And <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I said, well, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I, and I'm just a normal human. Not kidding. Let me show you. So I brought it in. We, uh, a few of our, uh, our, our, our team showed them this prototype, actually. I, I mean, this is a final form, but it's very close to this prototype. And watch me. There are three levels in there. Which level do you want the, me to put the ping pong ball on? And we did it by, by uh, well. And then I said, you try it. And they tried it. And um, they said, wait here. We're going to go call George Lucas. I won't bore you with the story. One thing led to another. It was a product um, in 2009. It took that many years, from 2005. Well, it took a year to ma manufacture. So from 2005 to 2008, three years of thinking about how to market this product, how, how to build a technology that nobody wants into something, something that somebody wants. Now, it addressed a big need. It addressed that 
um, people, there's a huge need out there for people who want to have not brainwave control, but the force. So sometimes you have to repackage your technology to something people are familiar with. The elderly wanted healthcare too, but they don't want to use gadgets, but they use the toilet, right? So you have to package your technology in a form factor, in a way, in, even in a name that, that uh, your target customers can accept. Today, we have Star Wars Force Trainer 2. Now this time, it's even more awesome because it was released with a new movie. And it has, it, this time it's improved from ping pong ball to a holographic image. You can actually interact with a hologram inside that little uh, pyramid. And uh, you can, not that I wanna be commercial here or anything, but you can buy that at Target and, and just about any retail. Actually, they're kind of sold out. And in fact, <laughs> uh, try Amazon or eBay for a used one. But I'll tell you a little story. Um, this is last year, right before Christmas, I received a call from the LA distribution center, Disney guys, Stanley, can you give us 8,000 units right now, right away? I said, why? Well, our warehouse got broken in, and they were all stolen, 8,000 units, and they're no, now all on eBay and stuff. Um, I said, where am I going to get 8,000 units right before Christmas, are you kidding me? Uh, all the factories are closed. So forever, they label me uh, no ability to manufacture right now. Well, okay, but that's a little side story you guys probably don't, don't want. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I think this thing is gonna continue. But that was our first product, okay? And it was, okay, it gave us the revenue stream and money to to operate till today, and we're actually in a, in a much bigger company now. We operate in many countries. But it started with that, and it started with, how do I address a need? And the need was people want to have, the people had desire for uh, practicing the force, or having harvesting the force. Okay, but right after that, I'm not gonna talk about how we expanded into m many different areas, but what's my second, where am I gonna find that second success? Well, I had a sweet success with Star Wars. What's the second most popular franchise in history? Maybe it's first, I don't know. How many of you want to take a guess? That's kind of magical. Harry exactly, Harry Potter. So I was sitting on the toilet again. <laughs> okay, after Star Wars, what do I do? You know, I was a CEO, I have to be responsible. It can't be a one product only thing. So, at that time, my kids were watching Harry Potter, and uh, I was thinking, oh, okay, maybe Harry Potter. And I looked it, looked it up. Who had the Harry Potter franchise rights or product? Mattel. And they're down in LA. So luckily, I have a few friends down there too. So I called them up. It, it, it pays to have friends. Um, <laughs> it, it, uh, I called them up. I said, hey, you guys have Harry Potter. Are you guys working on some? Yes, how do you know? Who told you? Well, you have the franchise, right? But who told you we're working on, uh, well, I skip a, a lot of details. This, right? <laughs> who told you we're working on this? I, I don't know, I was just guessing. Uh, the, the only game in the, the Harry Potter movie is the Quidditch field. So you must be, be building a Quidditch field. Now imagine this little thing that's brown and green. That's what it used to be. And they're gonna build a Quidditch field with the with the uh, golden snitch at the bottom right going through the hoops. But they're doing it manually. So how magical is that? You're supposed to do it your, with your magic, with your head, right? And, and you know, sp give a spell or something. And he said, well, okay. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And uh, they said, well, can you do that? I said, yes, I can offer you magic. And this time I didn't say the force. All right, come down. So I flew down to LA, showed them the magic, and there we go. It was uh, number one seller of that year. It went on a ton of magazines. Ellen DeGeneres visited it, na named it the product of the 
Um, no, actually, she, she said Star Wars was a better, better one. But anyway, um, uh, there, there was a fight. So this is the second. That was an advertisement by Mattel. So what happened to Harry Potter? Because after we, now keep in mind it has to be uh, priced correctly, right? So after we worked together and had everything said and done, um, they said, well, we have to keep this price down, but those Harry Potter guys want 25% of the revenue. And I said, well, gosh, if you just give me 5%, I'll do this. You know, why 25%? Well, they're, they're Harry Potter. I said, okay, how about this? Let's try out. Let's screw Harry Potter. Don't use Harry Potter. Just use, use a different name, and we, we, we franchise it ourselves. Right? We're, we're together. We, we'll do it. We don't need the, the name. It's magical enough. And they said, well, okay, we'll try it out. Sure enough, um, it was a very big hit. And it was big enough that uh, Mattel CEO uh, in the next quarter's uh, uh, conference call with the analyst talked about it being a franchise. So that's why he went from generation one to generation two. I don't think it'll ever be Barbie and Hot Wheels, but it's, it's doing okay. Um, <laughs> Barbie's tough to beat. Okay, so those were two examples of how to get your technology into the hands of your target customer with a package of what, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. That's what I learned over the years. It's never what you say, it's always how you say it, how you package it, how you sell the technology. It has to address three things. It's new, right? It's, everybody agrees it's new. But it has to address a need and it has to um, uh, uh, be cheap. Um, I got a few more examples, but I only have 30 minutes. I see that I have 20 minutes, so I have 10 minutes left. I'm going to walk through the rest real quickly and give you in, uh, some time to ask questions. So what are we doing today? We, like, like I said, we did the brainwave thing. We have the, um, a cardio signal. I mean, in fact, we have many cool stuff, but I'm going to give you this one particular technology. It looked like an Iron Man. That's why it's so cool, but it's not an Iron Man. There's a center module here that you, you wear. You don't even know you're wearing it. It's just embedded inside this uh, very cool looking shirt. But it doesn't have to be that color. It can be any color. Um, this shirt does a lot of things. Now, how many of you play with Connect? OK. You know how Connect works? It needs to see you. And, it, it, and then you, there's a lot of processing power going into processing the image and do something. So why do that? Why do you need to have Connect to see you to do motion control? Well, we can do smart fabric sensing um, by flexing my arms and doing this whatever position I do. It should know with the sensor. And we can provide that at a much cheaper price. And without Connect, we can do, the, uh, do it on the phone. So, um, and also, our brainwave sensors are being integrated into um, a lot of VRs and AR systems right now. So for gaming industry, I'm only talking about gaming, um, we can provide you with, with a total immersed gaming experience that tracks your, uh, your current body condition, tracks your emotion, and tracks your physical emotions all in one. And this was a uh, pretty hot hit uh, this year at the uh, augmented reality uh, conference. I, I, I actually um, received a lot of um, inquiries. Um, many VR companies are either have embedded into it, our, our sensors into the headset or in a process. This shirt actually is not a fantasy. It won the award in uh, France, in Paris. Um, I don't know what ISPO means, but it's an award. It was the number one award there. <laughs> Something in French yeah, that I need to 
think about later. How do we sell French bread at a higher price? Okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, lastly, I want to talk about this, and then I'll leave some minutes for questions if there are any. Um, this is, obviously I skip over a ton of different projects, but this is a project that's very meaningful uh, to me, and it's, it took me quite a few years to realize it. It's called MindScribe, uh, Brainwave Communication for ALS. And my, MindScribe, uh, ALS.com. And I would love to have you guys uh, push, uh, push the words out. It's not like we're trying to make a lot of money or anything. This obviously doesn't address a whole lot of uh, sector. But it does help people who can't move, who have locked in problems, communicate with their uh, family and friends and caretakers. It took us years at a money losing situation to de develop this because I wanted to help a lot of people uh, who have this condition. Not just ALS, but there, there are other conditions. So we're gonna launch this at the, uh, either at the end of this uh, month or sometime next month, and please tell your friends. And I'll tell you why I wanna do this. There's always a story. And this time I wasn't sitting on the toilet. Um, I was sitting in my office, actually, and I was minding my own business, calculating how much money I was making from the Star Wars for a trainer, <laughs> and making sure they didn't shortchange me. Then I got a phone call, and this woman, uh, and I promised her I would not disclose her name or her son's name, but this woman uh, called me up and said, well, um, I saw the force trainer and all that. I, do you have technology that can help me out? I said, well, what do you need? She said, well, um, I have a son who uh, has cerebral palsy by birth, uh, since birth. And I don't know if you know what that is. Uh, it means when you're being born, you go through the birth canal, and it kind of takes extra long, so you lose oxygen and it damages your brain, okay? And depending on the damage, some people have minor damage, some people have major damage. And in this case, her son, uh, I'm just going to name them uh, Andy and Mike, and, and Andreas, the mother Andy and the Mike, okay? They're, it's not their real name. I, I'm not supposed to disclose their names. Um, Andy said, well, uh, my son has cerebral palsy. The doctor thinks he's fine inside, but he can't move. He can't bat an eye. He can't do anything. I said, really? Wow. So I was thinking, what, what, what do I have to do with that? She said, well, you have this force trainer out there. Can you, do you, you must have better technology inside to uh, help me communicate with my son. So, well, I, I don't know, but we can probably, it does, are you sure he's uh, completely normal inside, just locked in? She said, well, that's why we guess. We don't know. Never talk to him. Um, I said, well, okay, let me give it a try. I, I was, she was very convincing, and she was local. So um, I went there with an engineer. And uh, we designed something real quick. I mean, we had software in the office. We gave them the ability, or the software and the ability to just to test it out. Say yes or no. Just just two commands for them. And it takes about it took about 15 minutes to train uh, Mike. Oh, by the way, when I showed up, I was surprised. Mike was 21 mm -hmm. years old. She's been caring for him for over 21 years. Okay, so we tried it out on him, we practiced, we, we tell him what to do, and he seems to be okay. So I asked Andy, well, can you ask him some questions that only you know? I mean, you know he'll say yes or no, based on what you, you know about him. So she did uh, some questions. Um, the answer came back correct. So, well, okay, a few things correct, it's probably working. So ask him a few more things. So she started asking him something more personal. Uh, do you know my, uh, uh, Mike, do you know I'm your mother? He goes, yes, and all that. So at that point, I was very touched. I said, Mike, do you love your mother? And he paused a little bit, and I could tell he was trying to use the, the strength to, to do it. He said, yes, 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 yes. We had an electronic sound there, so. So it wasn't very emotional, yes, but it was, uh, he was very, it, I could see the intensity. And at that point, Andy said, well, she, she was crying, of course, at that time, and she said, well, thank you, Stanley. This is the first time I communicated with my son, and the first time he said he loves me. Mm -hmm. 
And after that, I, was, I just gave them the whole setup, just have it, you know. Don't even pay me, forget it. I made enough money from the horse trainer. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you, I have to sit on the toilet to come up with a product to make money. When I sit on the chair, no, it's a money-losing proposition. But, <laughs> but it's good. This is a good um, thing. And ever since then, I wanted to devote some uh, capacity of our uh, engineering to do this, to help people out. Uh, we're going to be collaborating with a few big companies. Um, I won't say that because it's a surprise for the launch um, uh, for this product, but it's, think of it as a continuation of the ice bucket challenge, and we're meeting the challenge. We're going to provide a, a, a tool for people who can't communicate um, to communicate and uh, at least ease a little bit of their suffering. Thank you. I'll take any questions. I think I have three minutes. Are you ever going to do that bicycle park? Actually, we, we did it with Germany, with Audi, but I don't have time to show it. Actually, it's out there. There's a um, Google Audi mine race, and you'll see a big video about racing cars. With, uh, and they put their logo on our headset. <laughs> Four zeros. Right. <laughs> Nothing against them. I really like Audi. I drive one. So. Yeah. Do you think we have any pieces of robotic limbs that are out there now that, that people want that? OK, that's another thing I didn't have time to talk about. There are two, two things that happened at, off the top of my mind. Number one, Easton La Chapelle. Um, the guy who's on t TED Talk, um, he won the 2013 uh, White House uh, Science Fair um, competition. He built a robotic arm, and he drove it with our headset and shook hands with President Obama. That's how he won. Um, and there's another uh, company called Cyberdyne. Check them out in Japan. And it's the same spelling as Cyberdyne, the uh, Terminator. Um, they built exoskeleton suits. That you can actually step in, they use our sensor to sense the muscle signal, and you can learn how to rehab and walk again, or you can use it to lift very heavy stuff. It's really cool. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, sir. Any plans for maker kits? Uh, it's already been in maker kits in many, uh, many, many years, and uh, you know our community of developers really took over. We really don't do anything. You can buy a kit from us. Now, if a teenager can buy a little kit from us and, and want the science fair, it's pretty easy already. Um, but I would very, uh, I would highly uh, discourage you to use it in very inappropriate uh, um, things. I mean, you can check YouTube out. There's some torture device being built and all that. It's not very good. So. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.